Have a seat, Alan. No. <laughs> so, you guys know, I'm Owen, host of Aussie Fishing Adventures. I'm here with my buddy Eric. As you guys know, if you saw him on my last episode of the PA Wild Shark Chronicles, it was actually the first episode of this video series. And as I said, this video series could be ongoing for a while. But let him talk about what he's passionate about. Because he's really passionate about these fish. And he's told me everything I knew that I put into this first video. And we're going to have a bunch of videos, as I said, coming up in this video series. But yeah. Alright, young bull. <laughs> <laughs> what we're trying to do here today, the reason we're here, yeah. is that uh, there's a lot of confusion around... The regulation and the proposal and I'm gonna to try to uh, help people walk down that path to that understanding to see mm -hmm. that uh, how far-reaching it really is and how important it is I think a lot of people are thinking that it is a threat to that and I just want everybody to know nobody out there cares more about that than me mm -hmm. but what they don't see is that we can use the brown trout to get there brown trout it was introduced so many years ago and it's been adapting to our watersheds ever since right. uh, the ones that early were plant were planted early that they demonstrate the greatest genetic diversity and we've never managed for them ever for example well I don't know that, yeah. that's a that's a biggest brown trout I ever caught on a dry fly on March the 8th um, it was just shy of 28 inches it takes a lot for a fish to grow that large in the state of Pennsylvania the brook trout comes into the picture too because the brown trout that demonstrate the characteristic of movement like this yeah. that we're talking about, they don't spend all their time with the brook trout 365 days a year. In mm -hmm. fact, their primary reason for being up those streams is to spawn. They change the, uh, right. entirely when they're there, but they're holding lies. They're not always mm -hmm. feeding lies. They're more protected from predators because yeah. it's all the survival game. We got to let go. To get to this understanding, you have to let go of um, your thoughts around the brook trout. To a lot of people, the conversation around the brown trout ends yeah. with invasive. It just stops right there. We can't right. go any further. And that somehow we're made more virtuous by hating on the brown trout, which doesn't work because, in fact, how I feel about it doesn't make them go anywhere. So a conversation around the brown trout being an invasive, let's just put that aside because that's going to prevent us from... Going outside our comfort zone and affecting, enacting change in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. it's here. We've never protected one brook trout in the state of Pennsylvania by hating on the brown trout. It doesn't work that yeah, way. Absolutely. So let's protect the brook trout and let's make this about the brook trout, but that we'll get there. The study, the study, the reason for the study is to tease out from the data in that pre-spawn, post-spawn measure is we're going to study the impacts that stocking has Mm -hmm. on wild trout in terms of its size, growth rate, and movement. Okay. So the same competition that threatens the brook trout by the brown trout being in their streams, competing directly with them in a smaller stream, smaller habitat, mm -hmm. that competition we're going to study on an invasive fish that will demonstrate most easily those impacts. Right. And it translates well to the brook trout, but we have mm -hmm. to start this change somewhere. Can we all agree that stalking over wild trout has a negative impact on them? Because believe it or not, that was the argument up until about five years ago. Five years ago. About five years ago, that was still the big argument that, well, there's no change. It doesn't affect them. We're going to study that effect by that study. And uh, it's my belief that the competition in a smaller stream, less fertile, less food, less opportunity. Right. It's an unnatural population density increase. I think we can all agree with that. That makes common sense. We don't need study to show that stocking is an unnatural population density increase into a fragile environment where yeah. every fish is in a particular place at a particular time in order to get the most food with the least amount of energy spent in order to grow large and we wreck it. It's a tear. It's yeah. a there's a pecking order in that stream. And those fish, I actually had somebody say to me in a wild trout committee meeting for Trout Unlimited in Pennsylvania, he said to me, brown trout are unaffected by stalking. They simply leave and come back. That's where our mindset has been. That's how far down this. So I understand when people mm -hmm. uh, feel challenged by this new line of thinking, this yeah. new conversation, and why they may be put off by it or whatever, and they struggle to see it because there's so much thought to this from 30 years of studying these fish. Yeah that they don't see that where this chess move goes, what the future outcome is oh, yeah. in terms of turning that tide and, 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 and looking at our wild trout difference and, and how we stalk yeah. over them and manage for them. And it has a benefit to the brook trout. The brook trout are struggling, they're gonna struggle and they're gonna to continue to struggle. 
And unless we can stop the weather from changing, they're going to. Um, they're the first ones impacted by any change we make. That's why they're so precious. Right. They, they're acutely adapted to, well, they're the fish of the fountain. That's what their Latin name means, fish of the fountain, mm -hmm. which ironically, mm -hmm. of the two brown trout that were introduced in Pennsylvania over the years, and um, you can read them in books. If you don't believe right. me, go ahead and do your own research. Uh, I have an interesting book right here. I'll get it for you. Yeah. This is a limited edition. Limestone Legends. In this book, Charlie Fox writes all about the Loch Levin strain. The Loch Levin strain is believed gone. We believe all the brown trout are just one type of trout. They're all one, and that right. one is a stock trout. I've had guys get offended at me by suggesting that they didn't understand something when they said, a trout only needs two things in the wild to grow large, food and time. Mm -hmm. My response was movement. It requires yes. movement to provide both. Right. And that you've completely left out of the conversation because a stock yeah. trout, Owen, is in a, is in right. a runway with yep. a lid. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he don't have to go anywhere. To, he's fed. He's yep. propagated. That's completely gone. And with each generation raised in captivity, those fish become less likely to ever be like the ones we're trying to protect. And those fish don't spend all year with the brook trout. They leave behind their eggs and their spawn, which is food yeah. for brook trout. Right. Spend my, mm -hmm. been, there's a lot of things to it. It passed the point of the, the discussion around the brown trout being an invasive. And the more we talk about it, the more we have put aside how we feel around that fish, we can't protect both how we feel about the brown trout and the brook yeah. trout. The resident population, the black boar strain, the irony of the brook trout being called the fish of the fountain is the brown trout of the two strains. Matt Sapinski explained this to me. The German name for the brown trout that we brought from the Black Forest right. German area was Bach Farel, which means brook trout, literally. <laughs> wow. Brook trout. And <laughs> that, that has a lot to do yeah. with why it has the boogeyman. Right. But what we're stud our study will show is that stocking has taken our trout, whether it's crossed or not crossed, I believe there's still some pure strings of both right. out there. If they were crossed and they all became one, which one did they become? Well, a lot of people believe they became the resident. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that too, because everywhere across the state, Owen, we've stocked over those populations. Okay. And this study will show that that resulted in them right. becoming residents and to the detriment of the brook trout. That's important everybody understand that. That has that brook trout in mind, but because we talk about the brown trout, and a management for it. The brown trout is seen as something that can't even be included in a conversation around conservation because they're not a part. A part of what? A part of that environment to which what? Are we a part of that or two, or are we separate from that? Mm -hmm. I believe I'm part of that. I believe I'm a part of the same creation that made right. the brown trout and the brook trout. I'm not separate from it. And I recognize that everything we touch, we alter and we make unnatural. To try and make nature and take it, make it static, which it's never static, to go back to a time prior to us altering it, to try and right. believe in our minds mm -hmm. that that is more natural, of an environment that is continually changing is, is about protecting how we feel about it. That, that happened. That time has passed. We are here now. We have to use what we have now and value that, what we have, and manage for that for its greatest potential and respect all of it now for what we have, because that's how we lose things. Mm -hmm. That's how we destroy things, by protecting what we want and how we feel around it, over it. Yeah. And nature has zero <laughs> It doesn't care. <laughs> it doesn't care yes. what your name is, it doesn't care who you are. If you lay out there in that snow tonight, it'll kill you. Yeah. You make a mistake <laughs> out there, it'll kill you. It doesn't yeah. care. There's not care in this. It's about survival, Sub survival yes. for these fish. How do we help the brook trout survive better? Well, we don't do it by protecting how we feel about the brown trout. We just don't do it. We study the brown trout, we use what we can, we take what we know. We manage the brown trout in a different way that demonstrates for us the greatest potential that it has right. as a crop. And we target resident trout, which is becomes the sustainable yield. Mm -hmm. The sustainable, everywhere the brown trout exists in the world today and is native and is given the respect and they study it of all those populations in the world it is a benefit to the community of those fish in a natural setting that they mm -hmm. would have both movers and the trout that stay as yeah. residents 
as a survival mechanism against disaster so that 100% of the population isn't in any one place at any one time. Right. And we can effectively manage the resident brown trout and prune the tree for the benefit of both by taking that sustainable yield. Okay. Any responsible management of anything in nature from us requires an identification of a sustainable yield. It's responsible management. Mm -hmm. The brown trout offers that to the guy that wants to go and catch and keep his fish. The brown trout touches on every base that is used today to justify stocking over our wild trout. That's why we talk about the brown trout. Not because we don't like the brook trout or we think less of it. It's, 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 where the, it's at the brown trout by making it about the fish. Not politics, not egos, not anything of us. Remove all of us from it. Every line, everything. Yeah. We don't protect ourselves here. Let's just talk about the crop. What can we do to have the best fishing possible in the state of yeah. Pennsylvania? And it, that's where this conversation goes. So you got any questions for me? I know you've been having some questions coming up um, yeah. on, your, on your YouTube. People have been asking questions yes. and, and stuff like that. And we'd like to help you today to understand some of those questions. I'm sure you're going to have many. Yes. Um, there's a lot to it. And that's why we're doing this today yeah, rather absolutely. than me doing this. Yes. Because that's a book. Yeah, absolutely. This is, there's too much. Um, so we're going to try to simplify that. If you yeah. have questions, go ahead. What are some of the questions yeah. you got on YouTube? What were they around? Yeah. I did get a lot of questions talking about specifically, like, because I talked about the difference between the resident and the migratory fish and how you could tell how this one's more silvery and things. But people were asking, like, can they have a little bit more detail in relation to that and, like, right, what I, facts I, are backing that all up? All right, or... I, let's go there. Um, okay. What we're talking about is the difference between the Loch Levin strain and the Black yeah. Forest strain. Well, as it was described in the books, it was silvery and had black right. spots and the key characteristic that separates the two which requires a, a relationship to the fish itself within its watershed is, is movement actually right. that's the one thing that really separates them so the brown trout literally is the fish that can change its own spots okay. it's a leopard that can change its spots because it's so adaptable right it's so amazingly <laughs> adaptable so genetically plastic yeah. that when a population separates from the mover and and is now becomes a resident right. to an ecology anywhere in the world over time, thousands of years, separating, maintaining separation from the movers to the residents, thousands of years. They do it on their own mm -hmm. in eat, by changing their diets, what they eat and how they move and where mm -hmm. they spend their time feeding and stuff like that, times of the year when they spawn too. Yeah. They, they adapt to a smaller environment. That stream is smaller. There's less things to adapt right. to, less variables. And they adapt so acutely to each one because they're so adaptable. Wow. They mold to it so much that they change in appearance so much right. that it's created the argument of subspecies labeling versus lumping in genetics from taxonomists that go all the way yeah. back to Gunther and Widegreen and the, before they even came here. <laughs> and they're still fighting about them today. So it's a complicated conversation <laughs> to have. Right, yeah. And it's hard to get people to that line yes. of thinking but so appearance is hard to go solely from right it's actually the movement that separates mm. the two yes and when you and, when, and and i've spent my entire life trying to prove to myself that i am not fishing for lock levin strain right. trout yeah that's what i was saying. and that they're all crossed right and that's what everybody believes yep that's what ended the argument in 1950 we have genetic analysis we can do today. We uh -huh. can compare genetic analysis of the fish we have to wow. the actual fish they came from in their own homeland. Wow. So, and we can do that quick. Right. So that, that's what ended this conversation in, in 1950 with a letter yes. from the Federal Fish Hatchery right. Biologist to Charlie Fox and the boys at the Harrisburg Fly Fishers Club. And he said, most likely they're all crossed. But that behavior of movement is what separates them. And I've been witnessing that all my life. I've been mm -hmm. blessed to, to have witnessed that. I've watched yeah. a stream that was stocked become unstocked. Right. I've watched them colonize it. Yeah. I've watched a stream that wasn't stocked <laughs> become stocked and saw the effect yes. on this population of fish. On streams that I can simply walk alongside mm -hmm. and look in and, and see what's there. Yes. And I've been able to observe and witness that. And I think we're missing it. I think stalking over their nursery streams stunts them. I think they res it's, an, it's a result of the impact of mm -hmm. the stress that they create. It's comparable to if you're driving down the country road, listening to music, oh, great. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. great, you know, well, <laughs> and you're all relaxed and comfortable yeah. and you blink and you open your eyes and you're on a six lanes of, yes. oh, this is a highway <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's what them trout yeah. feel like when they're in that stream and you all yeah. of a sudden dump all these idiots right. in there, they're right. just swimming all over the place, yeah. randomly moving. <laughs> which is what a wild trout never can do. A wild trout cannot move randomly. 
the movement, more you understand yeah. the movement, more you understand the purpose of it, the more you see how how amazingly adapted they are to a, on a broader right. scale to many more variables in order to optimize their fitness within that ecology mm-hmm. on a bigger scale. The more you hunt them, yes. the more you respect them, the more you understand, wow, this thing's amazing. And it's really the reason fly fishing was invented. I mean, it was yeah. invented around fish like a, a 20, just tried 28, caught on a dry fly. Oh gosh. There's my beautiful, lovely wife. About a week after she gave birth, poor thing, she wanted to go fishing. There she landed. At, well, I don't. We never measured that fish. Uh, that was huge. <laughs> um, I got a picture of a good friend of mine who okay. now lives in Montana. He's a guide in Montana. He's been guiding on the Yellowstone and Bighorn rivers for 15 years in the Yellowstone area. He caught this trout before he went out there. I don't know how many years ago it was. Over right. 15, 20 years ago. And. The size of this fish, look how healthy it is, look how big it is, look how small its head is. This is an example of a fish that is extremely healthy. Now imagine the size of the eggs and the, uh, that that fish would produce. Would they have a better chance of surviving? You bet. That's called fecundity. These fish are the most fecund. Right. These are the fish that we've never managed for in the history of Pennsylvania. This fish is living and, making, and growing that size in a stream mm-hmm. we don't consider yeah. a trout stream. There's no greater evidence that we've misunderstood the brown trout and all that it offers than that. Yes. Fishing like that in a place that people would choose not to believe exists because they would rather believe it doesn't exist on a stream that's not considered yeah. trout water. Don't, this fellow right here wow. calls this stream. He won't tell you the name of it if you're in his boat as a guy, a client. <laughs> but he'll tell you this is one of the five best trout rivers in the country. And we don't in Pennsylvania consider it a trout stream. And nothing speaks more powerfully to me that right. we're missing something. What are we yeah. missing? We're missing the value of movement in terms of growth, fecundity, genetic diversity. And as an example, that those are early planting characteristics mm-hmm. prior to the trout becoming acutely adapted to survival in an environment that doesn't change. Our, our hatcheries don't change in water temperature. Those right. fish don't need to move. Yeah. They're handing down only what is a cons- constant, a consistent thing. That's what they hand down. These fish have learned to migrate throughout a stream, placing themselves in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. And they're not competing with the brook trout out there. Yeah. Not yet, but if we manage for the brook trout, right, I would imagine in some places, this value of movement, if we were to take that into consideration, mm-hmm. maybe we would see two pound brook trout again in the state of Pennsylvania. Hold, wouldn't you love to press the reset button and go back to that? Wouldn't you love to? Well, we can't do that. We can't okay. press the reset button, but this is how we get the ball moving. Yes. In that direction. Right. <laughs> Boom. Please, if you don't hear anything <laughs> I say, listen to that, please. Yeah. Okay, because it, it it, it, this is so hard for me to talk about because every time it comes out of my mouth, it comes out different. Right. There's so much to it. Yeah. Oh, Appalachian root beer, that's where it's at. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening to this awesome interview that I did with Eric Richard. It is only like one eighth of the interview, by the way. <laughs> I just wanted to add this information just since it related a lot to the petition, he answered a lot in relation to the petition and what this study is going to do and how it's going to improve wild trout, the expansion of wild trout, rather, these migratory wild trout throughout Pennsylvania's cold water and warm water watersheds. He's the expert on this. He's been studying these fish for a very long time. He might not have a specific degree on this stuff, but oh my gosh, he is just a wealth of knowledge. He knows so much, and I can't thank him enough for everything that he's taught me. So if you haven't signed a petition yet, in order to sign a petition, click the arrow next to the title of this video. Then click on the link to the Migratory Wild Trout Petition. Then once you're on the page, click Sign Petition. Then type in your name and your email, and press sign petition and you successfully signed the petition and if you want to add any comments feel free to add comments about our petition and what it's all about thank you and i can't thank everybody enough for all the support let's do this together let's get this petition to 1000 signatures and remember it's for the fish